The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. Heinemann is a provider of resources written by real teachers for real classrooms. Heinemann values teachers as decision makers and students as curious learners. Discover the path to lifelong professional learning at Heinemann.com. Heinemann is dedicated to teachers. I'm Brett from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're excited to bring to you the second conversation in our Turn and Talk series hosted by author Ellen Keen. If you missed the first installment, you can find it on blog.heinemann.com. Turn and Talk is a celebration of Heinemann's 40th anniversary, hosting conversations between authors who've written for Heinemann since its early years and those who are newer authors bringing their unique perspectives to the table. This series tackles issues facing educators today, like how much autonomy do individual teachers really have? And how do we ensure equity for all students? And what's it like to launch your ideas through books and podcasts into the world of education? Pattern after the New York Times Table for Three column, host Ellen Keene poses questions to authors and engages them in a reflective conversation. In this second Turn and Talk discussion, Ellen is joined by Tom Newkirk, most recently the author of Embarrassment and the Emotional Underlife of Learning and Kathy Collins, co-author of I Am Reading, Nurturing Young Children's Meaning Making and Joyful Engagement with Any Books. The authors share their teaching journeys, inspiration, and hopes for an equitable future in education. Here now is Ellen Keene. Welcome, Tom Newkirk and Kathy Collins. It couldn't be more pleasure for me to get to have the opportunity to chat with you this morning in this lovely summer morning in New Hampshire. And we're doing the turn and talk process throughout this year, as you may know, because it's Heinemann's 40th anniversary. We would love to hear about your impressions of Heinemann and its impact on you, Heinemann's impact on you as a writer, just in your lives. You both live near the Heinemann headquarters in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we'd love to hear about Heinemann's impact on your uh, professional and even personal lives. Well, for me, it's hard to know where to start because it's had such a profound effect. I joined the University of New Hampshire in 1977, and I remember coming up and having dinner and on one side of me was Donald Graves, and the other side of me was Don Murray, two Heinemann authors. And so this is just the year before 1978. And just how I've been shaped by their work, the work of others, and I think particularly by the work that was between 19, say, 1975 and 19. 19- 87, say that 12-year span, just how much was opened up. And I remember one thing, Don, Don Murray was not a boastful person, but one time he said to me, he says, you know, we're the pioneers and you're the engineers. That might be a little bit boastful, but in a way, I think so much territory was opened up during that time. And so much of the work that other people have done and that I've done has been kind of looking at the territory that was really kind of revealed to us during that maybe 12 year span. So it's shaped me as a scholar. It's shaped the friendships that have come. And I think it's shaped me as a writer in the sense that I didn't fall into a certain, I hope, and I think I have at times fallen into a certain academic style, but I think there's a kind of more direct style that came from the writing that was done at that time that shaped me. And so it's been a huge benefit to me. I was introduced to Heinemann by being the secretary at the Reading and Writing Project when I was in graduate school. And I, goodness, I didn't even know at that point who Lucy Calkins was. I just got a job at what was then the Writing Project. I was imagining being a a high school social studies ESL teacher with bangs, to be even more specific. Like just, (laughs) I I felt like I was, but I needed a job and I worked at the Reading and Writing, well, it was then the Writing Project with Lucy. And first I was the general secretary and then I became her secretary when she was working on the art of teaching writing. So Philippa Stratton at that time was Lucy's editor and Philippa would call the project and I would be so tongue-tied because I was talking to an actual editor of books and Mm -hmm. I was so intimidated. It, It just was, you know, I've never had met anyone, you know, in publishing. I I was just really intimidated. So I came in that way. And then just working at the Reading and Writing Project through the years, and so many people have that world and the world of Heinemann overlap so much. So at the project, they always have amazing speakers, and a lot of them are Heinemann authors. So there is such an expectation that teachers were reading 
professional literature and that teachers were thinking about it and talking about it in think tanks, not just at the project, but the schools with whom we work. So teachers would come in and sit at a table with Lucy or Smokey Daniels or Ralph Fletcher or, goodness, Donald Graves. I wouldn't have ever met him had I not been at the project. So it's just a really happy accident. Yeah, and a, <laughs> yeah, a happy accident that ended up turning out to be such an important part of my life. Well, it's interesting because, you know, having read what you've written for Heinemann and other publishers, I'm, I'm interested in something in that you said, Tom, and that has something to do with the happy accident. And that is the sort of style of writing that Heinemann has, has published. I would call it more accessible writing mm-hmm. to educators. I, I'm curious, how did you get into that style? That it's not an academic style. It's not a, I mean, for as writers, how did you switch from doing graduate papers that had to be APA, you know, compliant to th- that sort of easy, natural conversational style that you both write with? Well, I think we had good models. You know, I think of uh, the opening sentence to uh, Don Graves' uh, Teachers and Children at Work is uh, children want to write. And I've said before that that's the kind of sentence Mm -hmm. that you're taught never to write as an academic. Unqualified, personal, simple. The first sentence, essentially the first sentence of, I think, the launching of, of Heinemann, children want to write. And he was an academic. He was an academic. And he, you <laughs> yeah, know, there yeah. he was, bravely. So, and I think, I think he was, he was shaped and taught by Don Murray, who, uh-huh. who came from a more journalist, maybe what we call creative nonfiction background. Yeah. So I think that background in accessible journalism, creative nonfiction yeah. is really important. And certainly a line that I've used when I've worked with teachers is that one thing you have to remember as a writer and as an editor is you're probably writing for somebody who's tired. So that's always I mean, great if you think, you think of what, yeah. the time the teachers have to read, oh, you know, my gosh. Yeah. early in the day, late in the yeah. day, you're going to write for somebody who cannot work through certain traditions of academic writing that yeah. needs to be direct. It needs to be personal. I think if it's funny at times, I think that gives a, gives a boost. And I think it has to, it has to have a you know, story. So <laughs> those are the, those are the, about su- that. surprisingly <laughs> enough. I think that's a new project for you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 New idea. But, um, you know, Tom, you're writing, there's this elegance there. It's so scholarly and academic. You feel like you're reading something that's making you, the reader, smarter because it's written so beautifully and elegantly, but yet it's also so accessible. And, and I'm not even just saying it because you're sitting here, but <laughs> you know how people see colors? What is that called? Synesthesia. Oh, synesthesia. Yeah. I think I have a, a gift. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll put it, that, do way. it that way. But when it. I read things, I have a visceral reaction. Like I hear rhythm or I, I can feel it in some way. And this is going to sound like it should be cut as it's coming out of my mouth. But when, it's when, I, read, stay when I read um, <laughs> your writing, it's just so refreshing, like going through a sprinkler. And, and that I can't, that's always what I think of because it's so refreshing, recharging, fun and funny. Funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and well, so I you. think you, you go both ways. Well, I think um, one thing that I've always felt like it, in terms of the people that I read in my life, that I have my own team of people that I think are supporting me. Some of them are living, some of them, you know, I've known, some of them, you know, died 400 years ago, but they're, they're a team that I call on. It's not I'm citing them, you know, to back myself up or anything. It's like, I'm going to bring my team to this game, yes, <laughs> you yeah. know, and they're going to be in the, you know, they're going to help me out. Yeah. And I've always felt that. And your team, Kathy, is teachers. Yeah. So I have not come, I mean, aside from doing papers in graduate school, I didn't arrive from an academic writing yeah. point of view or, you know, experience. So the interesting thing when Tom was talking about that is I thought, well, where did where did it come from? And again, working at the Reading and Writing Project, so much of how we communicate with teachers was and is orally through speeches and workshops. So like the voice I think I have in my writing is my talking voice because I'm constantly talking to teachers and maybe it's more conversational for better or for worse. I mean, everyone has a voice, but you know, half of the people it might work for, but a, half of the people might be like, mm, not my favorite. And I mean, I guess that's how anything is. Teachers will say, oh, I'm thinking about writing a book. And I often say to them, present on it a lot 
because it'll get your language. You'll, you'll see an audience and you'll see what resonates with them. You'll feel their energy when you tell it this way. You can tell, you know, the heat of response. This is why it takes so, me six years to get a book out yeah. because I have to try it in classrooms. I have to speak about yes. it a lot. Yeah. And then you have to, the, finally, you find yeah. it. But yeah. that's so mm-hmm. true. I, yeah. So that to, really you talk with through me, it. Yeah. And I, I had an experience writing with somebody who did come out of an academic writing. All of her writing is was academic writing for journals. And, and so when we were collaborating on a project, we had a little bit of code switching that we both had to do. And she would read a portion of mine and say, I don't know if you could say that exactly. To Tom's point, it wasn't, you know, what did you say at first? Not verifiable, or, you know, that yeah. there wasn't a research Wouldn't base. Wouldn't make it an appear yes, journal. Right? exactly. But I thought, but that's how I would say it to teachers. Yeah. What? And so the, we both learned so much. She helped me get my writing to stand up straight. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm hoping that writing with me helped her think of the audience, you know, not the peer review yeah. necessarily. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you both, you know, it, obviously you've emphasized this in your writing and in your speaking, you both write from a place of story, from the, from a narrative. It's, you know, your comment, Tom, about, you know, taking the reader by the hand and bringing them along with you. And I, that you know, that was never more evident for me, or, you know, maybe not never, but it was very evident for me in the book, The Teacher You Want to Be, that um, I was lucky enough to co-edit with Matt Glover. And both of you wrote, of course, essays there that spun off of belief statements that were um, cooperatively written and rewritten and revised um, in part by a group that went to Reggio Emilia, Italy to, to look at what they're doing there. But the belief statements that anchored that book, you both took an angle on those belief statements and wrote off of them, these beautiful essays, both very, very different essays, but both really telling a story. And I'm wondering about the um, experience you had and the um, thoughts you have about belief statements, about creating a set of sort of your lines in the sand, as it were, that, that these are, you know, this far and no further. What's the role, if any, of, of belief statements <laughs> For, for educators. Do you encourage your students at the university uh, when you were teaching Tom and your teachers, Kathy, to create belief statements? Are those something that we just sort of know internally? And is it in these days where we have less and less choice in, is, certainly in public schooling, is, is it even worth it? I'll just be provocative and say, is, is it even worth it to, to come up with belief statements? What's the point? I mean, you know, you're going to get told what to do anyway. Um, so it, that just harkens back to your experience in writing those essays. And I'm I'm curious what you think about this. I think you have to have that code. I mean, I think it's absolutely essential. And it seems to me that belief statements come out of autobiography so that I think that our philosophies are disguised autobiographies, that they, they really come out of life experience. And for example, in the essay that I wrote in um, The Teacher You Want to Be, I have real resistance to people in authority telling me what is true and what I must do. I have, I have a problem, as I think you do, Ellen, frankly, <laughs> terrible, with compliance. Terrible problem. And yes, I mean, I, me I, lots I almost, and lots of speeding I almost have a visceral reaction to anybody telling me what to do, even if in re- retrospect that thing they're telling me what to do is a good thing. But my reaction I, I, is I, I not to, not to comply yeah. and to rely do on, the opposite. rely on what I see and what I feel at the moment is the right thing to do, uh, and not to accommodate programs and plans. And I think writing that chapter, to some degree, it comes out of a belief statement, but that belief statement comes out of something else. And that something else is kind of a, kind of a life experience where I am consistently challenging things. And one thing that I don't like to challenge, but I feel like I need to challenge is people who claim that research is going to solve the problems of teaching. You know, and you see things like what works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whenever I see somebody says what works, my hackles go up because I say what works when everywhere, you know, for every situation, for whom without interpretation. And there's this, there's this (laughs) biblical term called kairos. It's a Greek word and it means timing. And how much of teaching is about timing? You know, you, so feedback is good. Research says that, but what kind of feedback and when Mm -hmm. and how? Now, can research tell you about timing? I don't think it can. 
Can research tell you when you have to reprimand your kid and when you have to leave your kid go? Can research tell you that? Yeah. No, because that's about timing. That's about Kairos. So I have this (laughs) resistance to systems, programs, research, authority that tells me that there's a system that could solve the problem that can relieve me of these excruciating decisions that we often make badly, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's... It's an interesting perspective coming from someone who spent his life in academia. Yeah, well, I think if you spend enough time, you learn to distrust it, you know? And research is based on a certain population. Are you part of that population? That's even true in medicine, yeah. you know? I mean, you have something come out about blood pressure. I mean, does that include you? I mean, does it not? You know, even that's that's a real conceptual problem. So yeah. there's a kind of a resistance to that that's part of what what I do. So if somebody, like when I was on the playground and somebody would say, you know, you know, say something like, you know, and then what we would say is, says who? Yeah. <laughs> says who? Says who? <laughs> And that's that's you're not the boss of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's the, the, the slightly more modern yeah. rendition yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and and I think connected to that, Tom, I think of the you know the tyranny of data. Like, well, the data shows, and I often use this again story, and it comes out of your personal experience. Uh, our son, our younger son, has type one diabetes, so we have data, like twelve data points a day, checking his blood sugar, and so his endocrinologist could look at a weekend and create a treatment plan, but maybe, you know, he also needs, there needs to be story around the data. Like how old is he? Oh, he's an adolescent growth hormones or, oh, he was at a sleepover or his pump was malfunctioning. So that also drives me crazy The you know, the fetish of data that data says, but the, as belief systems, I think it's, it's this exercise. It's, it can seem like a, a new teacher that you're often called upon to do that in graduate school, what is your philosophy of teaching when you apply for a teaching job? And I, when I was writing that essay and that prelude to the philosophy or the, the belief systems, my husband's school was having a job search and he was on the selection committee. And so there was an essay, what is your philosophy about teaching, your beliefs about teaching? And he said so many of them were almost boilerplate. And they said the things that every teacher should say. And that's where it really struck me. Like it has to be more than just this exercise, you know, if you had a bag of teacher fortune cookies, you want (laughs) to, you want the beliefs to say more than like what's your different things. And so I think just, uh, and belief systems morph and modify. I mean, I think there's core things, but we also add new things to them that maybe we didn't think of Mm -hmm. before, you know, with our limited experience, the more experience we have, the more things we understand and might come to believe about teaching and learning. And I think having teachers with extraordinary belief systems is so important to a community because they hold down history. So I was working with a teacher, um, a kindergarten teacher, and she said how concerned she is. She was getting set to retire. And she said, no, these new teachers are the most efficient human beings I've ever met. They, you know, you say, oh, we need something. They can whip it up in a second. They know all the, you know, great places to find the font and their anchor charts are stunning. But I watched a teacher, a kid came into school crying this morning and the teacher said, oh, get, you know, get your jacket off and start your morning work. And she said that efficiency, because there's so much to cover. And she wasn't judging this teacher. She's more bemoaning the context of teaching right now. Well, we got to jump right to it because we're supposed to be doing small group work at 1010 and, you know, no time for tears. Um, (laughs) And she said, you know, that child would have walked into her classroom. She would have brought that child over and, you know, rubbed his back while he told her what was going on. And I think that exudes belief system, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So you want to have teachers in a school who I think about working at PS321 in Brooklyn, where belief systems abounded. And Renee Dinnerstein, you know, I did research in her classroom when I was a research assistant at the Reading Writing Project. And so she's one of those people, like, Anytime I think of something that I want to do with young children, I always think, what would Renee say? We want to, as we're forming our belief systems, have belief systems of those we admire, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. as mentors, again, thought leaders, thought really. leaders. And I think it's healthy for a school community every once in a while to just 
gather and generate for the community, but then also have individuals have some agency around their own belief systems. Yeah. yeah. Um, And when you run into these obstacles, you know, what do you say to educators when they encounter that? I I certainly encounter it a lot in my work with teachers. And it's I'm just curious to hear how you react to that. But I hear a lot of teachers will say they'll say it in meetings or they'll they'll say it on a grade level. Somebody will say, well, they said we have to do it this way. And then the teacher response to that is, who said it? Who's they? So we always want to check in with ourselves. Who's they? And is it really what they mm-hmm, said that mm-hmm. it has to go this way? You um, said that in your essay. Oh, did yeah. I? Yeah, oh, you oh, said shoot. something like that. In, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. okay. Yay. <laughs> um, but it wasn't. Don't quote yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh gosh, I wasn't even. I I got that from. I hear that a lot. But you hope that you're educate in the hierarchy in a district or a state that the educators would be responsive if you really came to them reasoned and with research and evidence, children's work that can support what you're saying. You hope that they would Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. turn down the volume on the rigidity. I say to teachers, I think a little civil disobedience is a very healthy thing. And it really goes back, Tom, to what you were saying. And and it reminds me of what Graves said, the enemy is orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And so what I think I'm hearing in this conversation is, yeah, we need to have our lines in the sand. We need to know what our core is. It's always changing. It's very dynamic, never static. But it also has to push again the sort of belief statement by online, you know, yeah. on a, a template for a belief statement. It has to come mm-hmm. from our lived experience, our autobiography. Mm-hmm. The enemy is orthodoxy, I think, is is going to be um, one of my lead, my, my lead in lines. I, I would say the enemy is also clutter. You know, the enemy, the enemy is that you have so many things that could go on in this school and you're going to have to learn how to say no. Say no. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. So that you, what, what happens is you, you have things that are valuable or possibly valuable, but there's the crowding, yeah. there's so many the crowding out other things. Yeah. And so. It's like so, patting a kid on the back. And yeah. Right. And so, yeah. so you have schools that say, we don't have enough time to do writing. Which is, that's like in your life saying, I don't have enough time for my kids. Well, if or that's the eat. case, you have to reorient yeah. things. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So just making a segue from that, I, I think when, when we write belief statements, it's, I was sort of doing some writing of my own this summer, just in a notebook. And I was doing some beliefs work and I came across just out of my head came this, idea that school has to be joyful. School has to be funny. And where has our sense of humor gone really in American education? I want to laugh all day. I want to laugh with my colleagues. I want to laugh with the kids. I want to laugh at the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I used to teach seventh grade. I was laughing at the kids a lot because they're funny yeah. and, and they take themselves very seriously. And I, I just started writing more and more about how, gosh, how missing, you know, humor is in this very serious environment of public schooling these days. And you two, of course, are both known for your uproarious humor. I mean... (laughs) If there isn't a beginning of the school year video, Kathy, I don't know how I can go oh on my gosh, in my I life. I mean, I dig really out my wings. cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just wondering what you see and what your you know thoughts are about that. Well, a really quick thing that I think about this, uh, you know, there's certain occupations like high stress occupations. My mom is she's 75. She's still a nurse, working full time as a nurse. Police officers, emergency room doctors, you know, the firefighter. There's a gallows. Human Humor about your work. My mom would talk about things nurses made fun of together, and it was just like, oh, that's weird. But so I think, and, and teaching, well, it, it's it's got a different kind of high stress, high pressure, fast moving lives are at stake. So I think a gallows humor is healthy, you know, an in group humor. Where I think of a colleague down the hall who. We had so many inside jokes about kids. They were loving. They were from a place of a real like appreciation for this child's quirks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, but you need those outlets in school, that, that pressure release valve. And Tom, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I've heard you present and you're, I'm laughing and I'll look around and then the, like the laugh to not laugh ratio. Well, for you, for me, for Ellen, you too, you say things, you're irreverent in talks. Um, You look and it might be like one out of three people are laughing out loud. And I think it's 
partly, well, maybe it's not funny to them, but it's also partly people are like, wait a minute, is this even supposed to be funny? Should we even be laughing at this serious enterprise? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, yeah, that's what I'm, why I sort of thought about the question, because this is, you know, there is so much that's serious. And in, in this current uh, political climate, no matter what your political persuasions are, there's an enormous amount of stress mm-hmm. and tension and just rough edges that we're experiencing every day in a sort of bombardment. And I want teachers to still feel able to have the sort of <laughs> jokes yeah. about a kid's quirk and not to feel that that is wrong in some way, that it feeds us, right? This, this, this humor. Well, we, we can feel it phys- physically when we laugh. We just yeah, feel yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, right? yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, you don't need research. Yeah, it's been to, studied so. scientifically yeah, I mean, too. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think humor is a recognition that things often don't go right. That's a great, you know, yeah. that, that we're, we're fallible as teachers and we start with a lesson and it goes spectacularly wrong. And so then one as way you we, talk about an embarrassment. Oh, so one way we recoup is we tell the story and then we, yeah. you know, then it becomes something really positive yeah. for us. I think if you, if you're just totally immersed in the system and you can't make fun of it, you can't make fun of yourself. That's, it's a kind of insanity. It's yeah. a kind of like it's a prison, a, a kind of prison. Yeah. 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 One time, um, my husband is teaching middle school, and one of my kids said, this was early in the year, Dad, what was funny today? Tell me, you know, and I think that made me think a teacher should, you know, every day do like your laugh check, like, oh, how many times today did I laugh out loud yeah. with kids? How many times did I laugh in my head at <laughs> shenanigans that, you know, I couldn't laugh out loud, but I could laugh in my head at shenanigans? How many times did I laugh with colleagues in a healthy building, a healthy school? You should hear some laughter. I th- I just, I can't think otherwise. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I just, I worry about our, um, our colleagues who are newest in the profession and just hoping that they can... Take a deep breath, let go a little bit, and let that humor be part of. Of kids are funny, yeah. <laughs> you know. That's why we're here. Kids are hilarious. I I don't go through a day. Do you? You're in a classroom with you know second graders or seventh graders when it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> we should hella, just yeah. let that. Yeah, let that be. So I th- I think um, segueing to a little bit more a um, bit more serious topic. I've been fascinated and actually did some rereading in both of your books recently by the. The old notion of kid watching. Um, you had a Goodman, I think, talked you know a long, long time ago about the, the importance of kid watching, and and I've been committing in my own classroom uh, demonstrations and visits to classrooms around the country to absolutely positively, it's line in the sand, set some time aside to just stand back and observe and to ask teachers to do the same and and to, to really um, experience the power of observation, which I think is is potent. And I think it feels like our classrooms are so um, somewhat high stressed. And I think that stress rolls over to kids. Um, and I've been wondering about the, the power of silence. I write about that a little bit and mm-hmm. about the, um, the power of observation of just standing back and truly just taking time to watch kids. And I, I'm guessing that most teachers would say they don't have the time to do that. And so I, I was, you know, pouring through both of your books and Tom in, um, holding on to good ideas in a time of bad ones, <laughs> a title that is perhaps more relevant today than ever. It's, al- it's always going to be relevant. It's yeah. always going to be relevant. You talk about uh, several habits of mind, including the habit of observation. And mm-hmm. and I, I pulled a quote. This is the capacity to slow down, pay attention, notice the unusual detail, fact, or statistic, one that is not evident at first glance. Mm-hmm. Why is it important to, to be an observer in, in your views? Well, I, I think if you just, if you're in a hurry, you're going to see what you expect it to see. And so then you're, you, nothing's changed. I mean, basically, you're just reinforcing your, your uh, expectations and you're not, see, you're, not, you're not learning anything. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be surprised. You're not going to be surprised. You're not gonna, there's something invigorating about being surprised. That's surprise. And there's a physiological aspect. You know, you feel, oh, okay. I mean, you feel, you feel it in your body, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's what learning is, is feeling that in your body. And if, if you're in a hurry and on a system and on a pace, Basically, you're not going to experience that at all. 
And, you know, Kathy, looking at your work and Matt's work, when I've read it and when I've heard you and Matt present, I think, yeah, this is, this is kind of where we came in and looking mm-hmm. back at Heinemann. This is, you know, looking at what kids do, asking them questions and say, looking at these early reading behaviors that are, we, we might mm-hmm. think are not reading, but really the kids are beginning to put together all Absolutely. the components yeah. of reading. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, if you're in a hurry, you think, well, the kid's not ready. He's not, you know, this, yeah. is, this is pre-reading. Yeah. You know, this yeah. is something yeah. else, you know? Yeah. And I think you've captured that. And I think that, yeah. look at some originating ideas for Heinemann. I think that it's is one of them. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely. When I was a research assistant, that was such a great job because all I was doing was going into classrooms, watching yeah. kids and watching teachers. So I wasn't watching curriculum. I wasn't watching clocks. I wasn't watching for the most exquisite teaching point. I was just watching what teachers did, how children responded. And it was so funny. So I back then it was, you know, you didn't have your smartphone, you weren't videotaping anything. So I was transcribing. And so I, I'd go to these think tanks. I'd ha- I, it was just so funny. Uh, every Thursday, the project has the, you know, uppercase think tanks. And then you'd have the big one. Then you'd have the little one that was at that point that was really studying the teaching of reading. And it was almost like Lucy would ask me to do my bits. Hey, Kathy, do that six-year-old. And she'd have me like <laughs> read the transcript almost like all the voices of it because they valued that so much the kids responses that it sort it just taught me to value the kids <laughs> responses and I think sometimes teaching we're so like uh, about us because you've got to get the mini lesson done in this time and you've got to get to so many conferences and how am I going to get around to all my kids that we what well, you've both said the rush makes the kids almost opaque in a way. And, you know, we get more worried about the clock. But, um, yeah, that that is just really fun watching them bumble around a little bit. Yeah, informative. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. How do you know where you're going yeah. <laughs> tomorrow unless we're really taking time to stand back? And I'm, you have to teach the kids to... You know, let you do that, right? I mean, that's a process in and of itself because, especially like in a transition from you know a whole whole class interaction to individual work or small group work, the first thing you're going to have six kids, you know, clinging in some way or another, and that's the time when I love to just say, "I'll be so interested to hear how you solve that problem, sweetheart," and uh, this is my time to watch the readers and writers and just. It, there's, it's just a wealth of information. It's a gold mine, really. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's a habit of curiosity too. Yes. Yeah. So, when you're curious about things, you feel you don't fully understand, mm-hmm. and it's easy to think you understand mm-hmm. something. But, but almost anything you think you understand, if you take some time and look at it more, you're going to see that you didn't understand. Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's true. true. That's true. In reading. life, <laughs> it's true. Reading. You can yeah. take you can take a book that you read a million times, The Great Gatsby. Yeah. And if you yeah. look at a passage carefully in The Great Gatsby, you're going to see something you never saw in yeah. any of those earlier readings. Absolutely. Yeah. So finally, this morning, I want to um, explore this question that we'll be exploring in each of the turn and talk conversations. And it's, um, it's a, I think a question that I'm hoping will be more a part of every school's conversation. Every pair of, of the turn and talk participants are going to be asked this question. I just need to cite uh, a study to begin. According to a, a September 2017 report from the Center for American Progress, quote, efforts to increase teacher diversity have led to marginal increases in the percentage of teachers of color from 12% to 17% from the period of 1987 through 2012. But this positive statistic obscures other troubling facts, such as the decline in the percentage of African American teachers in many large urban districts and the lower retention rates for teachers of color across the country. So I'm curious what you two make of this and what conversations you've been a part of that have been productive or useful in terms of solving or addressing these seemingly and transigent problems. What are your thoughts about whether currently, you know, whether we're in the classroom or not, we're, we ought to be doing to address that dilemma? 
I was um, talking to a principal at a school where there's one teacher of color, and I was talking to the principal about hiring, and he was saying how you know we'd love we would love to have more diversity. You know, when we post jobs, we're we're not getting diverse applicant pool coming in, and so it made me think of I forgot that Kevin Costner movie, um, Field of Dreams. Like if you post it, they will come. Right. And I don't, I think that's too passive. Yeah. You know, there's the National Alliance of Black School Educators reaching out to them, looking on their website. They have career opportunities. They have job postings. Being a little bit more proactive mm-hmm. to find people and to mm-hmm. find candidates. It's urgent that schools reflect the world for students. And there's to add to your statistics, Johns Hopkins had a study that I think it came out April 2017. And the study showed that for African American students experiencing one black teacher between grades three and five, they're almost 40% more likely to graduate, almost 40% more likely to be interested in college at that mm-hmm. time. And so we can look at it and say, oh, it's so great for our children of color to have teachers, mm-hmm. that idea of the race match effect, that which is like a role model effect. But Gloria Latson Billings also said it, it's good for everybody. White children need mm-hmm. to have teachers of color. So I guess one question to your quote is about attracting teachers or uh, hiring them. But the other issue is then the retaining. Mm-hmm. And you look at a community, you know, how does the community support teachers of color? Because every teacher I ever meet, I don't have a racist bone in my body, which might be true. But what structurally and systemically around might be contradicting that? I don't know. But I'm thinking about it a lot. And we can do little things like when we present at conferences, we can be on panels that are diverse and we can, you know, amplify voices of teachers and educators from different communities than ours, different, you know, ethnicities and races. So, you know, individually, we have a lot to do. One last thing I'll say, and I got this from Yara Shahidi uh, was being interviewed on my favorite podcast, Keep It. A little shout out for Keep It. Um, she was being interviewed. She's 18 years old and she's a superhuman activist. And she talks about how every time she meets a teenager and she'll say, oh, how old are you? Oh, I'm 13. Oh, only five more years till you can vote. She said those little teeny things plant seeds. Oh, you're 17. Oh, you're going to be voting next year. And she leaves it at that. So the new thing I'm doing is when I work at a school as or a district and it's my first time, I'll talk to an administrator, principal or literacy coach. Oh, you know, what are your demographics? And usually it'll, they'll talk about kids. Oh, we have X percent African American students or, but I'll, I'll also say, Oh, how many teachers do you have? Mm-hmm. You know, just to, you know, put the, this raise the, the consideration. awareness. Yeah. yeah. So the, there's these little things we can do as well as the big things, the systemic mm-hmm. things we can do. Yeah. These are the important questions. I feel like those of us who are white are flailing a little bit. And I think it's a good flailing. Um, Mm -hmm. Kathy, I really appreciated your question when we first started talking about this gathering. Kathy said, I'm I'm not sure if you are aware, Tom, that, you know, wow, that's three white people talking. You know, what, what is the balance going to be across the series of four? And of course, the balance is going to be, you know, different than it is today. It is going to be a balance. And, and, you know, that's been a high priority. And yet, sure enough, those are the little questions that you're talking about that we just have to remember to ask. Yeah. Um, and in faculty conversations, I think, too, those little questions can go a long way toward raising some well, awareness. Well, and one thing about retention, too, I've just been reading a lot about the stress on teachers of color because, uh, you know, one teacher in this article was talking about he's the one who's always, when the African-American kid has trouble in class, they send them to this teacher Um, or at a faculty meeting when something, you know, when there's a a school shooting or something and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, society is going on, which is every single day as something's going on, people turn to that teacher. Oh, tell us what to do. And I think that death by a thousand cuts like that just that it must be exhausting it is exhausting Uh, and yeah yeah, and and you can understand exactly and so you know microaggressions all the time just it gets probably gets too much and you're just professionally but then also watching how children are treated kind of related to what you said on 
terms of the difficulty of these conversations, I think that among white people, there's a sense of maybe avoidance because it's awkward and they don't know what to say. And, and I, I compared it when I re- read the question for a long time, unless as a family member at a memorial service who passed away, I avoided going to memorial services. And I avoided going them because I knew I'd be going through some line and I have to say something to people who are bereaved. And I didn't know what to say. And I was thinking that there's the right thing to say or the comforting thing to say. And I wasn't sure what that thing to say was. And then at some point I just turned and I said, I'm just going to go. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. You know, and it might not be the right thing, but I'm just going to go and be there for them. And I think with race, there's maybe something, I mean, there's avoidance. Like, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to say the offensive thing? If I ask you to be on this panel, are you going to think that I asked you to be on this panel because you're African-American? You know, all those are awkwardnesses that we just have to dive into, Mm -hmm. I think, and try to be the best person we can be. And because I think like... Like with retention, if we get an African-American teacher at Oyster Oyster River, which we don't have right now, uh, how is it going to be awkward for that person? Well, yeah, it's going to be awkward for that person. Yeah, it's going to be awkward for us to bring that person into the community. But how will Let's do it. I mean, you know, it's like let's do it and let's embrace that awkwardness. If we're going to get hung up on those things, Mm -hmm. we're just Mm -hmm. we're just not going to take the effort. So, uh, Mina Shaughnessy talked about basic writers. Says sometimes you just have to dive in and and trust that you know you're going to even if you don't say the right word or even if you know you're you're going to be able to work your way through it as opposed as opposed to avoiding it. And I think it's Mm -hmm. easy Mm -hmm. it's easy as a white person to just to say I'm not going to engage because I. I just think I'm, I'm going to say the wrong, the wrong thing. I'm going to offend you. I'm going to, yeah. you know, and I think I think to get beyond that, I mean, that doesn't solve everything. Obviously, yeah. right. people going in the profession, they have to make enough money to pay off their college yes, loans. Exactly. And if you're going to pay $40,000, I mean, it's all systemic yeah. things, you yes. know. Yeah. But I think in terms of personal, you know, if this African-American teacher comes into the school, connect with them. Use use your, your best human instincts yeah. to reach out and trust that even if, you know, if you don't say the right thing or it feels awkward. And we will make you, mistakes. Yeah. I mean, there, we will, you know. But, but, tr- <laughs> but I think partly we, we, can, we, can become, we can become paralyzed by our sense of whiteness privilege and so we don't do anything. Yeah. And I think that's worse than doing something and maybe making a mistake. Yeah, because yeah. of a mistake you can work on and grow from. Well, and, and you know, white privilege, well, there's white student privilege to always see a white face. And so, you know, that to just yeah. switch that off a little bit. But somebody else in our community, who Tom, uh, Tom and I share a great love and affection for, Shauna Coppola. Yeah. Um, she wrote a book called Renew. Shauna and I, in response to some things going on in our uh, school community, created a workshop talking about race in predominantly white classrooms that we offered to our teachers in our children's district. And we had three sessions, and the teachers came with... Uh, desperation to want to, and I'm using air quotes to do right. Like, and, but we picture Kathy using air yeah, quotes every, now. But air quotes. But one of the things that teachers would say things like, well, we don't know what to say. So, you know, or it's too early, especially for young children. Now, well, it's not yeah, too early no. because yeah. racial prejudices are, you know, from Babies right. have course, started course, developing yeah. prejudice and so, um, our ideas about race. So it's never too early. If we come at it with good intentions, like we want to presume good intentions and we can fix things when they go awry. And so I don't know, but it's good hard work. And the, and the school district takes that on as a, as a district. You took that on yeah, and, yeah. and presented those, you know, that, that to me seems like, um, an opportunity for people to, you know, in a safe environment to just be able to talk to each other in a very small, you know, I'm, I'm turning and talking to you about, you know, my feelings that I may well, have been. And the teachers said the district really was making sincere efforts all year long. That came out of an incident, and um, and I give uh, my children's school district, school board, the administration credit for really trying to think. But one of the teachers said, so they had a person come in, and they had district-wide diversity workshops, and the teachers who came to Shauna's and and my session, it was smaller, you know, maybe there were twelve teachers at a session, and Shauna and I realized very quickly 
they just need to talk because yeah. we brought, we had our slides, we had our yeah. activities, yeah. but they just needed to talk. Yes. And then somebody could say, this happened to me. And then another teacher chimes in, oh, well, here's what I did. And the teacher said, you know, it would be really nice brings us right back to the beginning, like Mm -hmm. time to talk and slow it down a little bit so you could really dig into things. Yeah. You know, I, you know, you, it's been showing up on social media a lot. The, you know, the idea that white people may leave their homes each morning and have something unpleasant or unhappy happen to them, but it won't be because of our skin color. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, that was a very, you know, that really struck home with me. I may have a a horrible day in a lot of ways, but it won't be because of my skin color Mm -hmm. and people of color, obviously every day, every every day. day. Yeah. So that awareness and the kinds of conversations that I'm going to say this in air quotes that we let that you and Shauna let them just, you know, you put your plans on the back burner and let them have this conversation, you know, made that conversation possible, I think is a beautiful beginning. And this will be then the beautiful end. Of- well, and I just, Tom Newkirk, I just am so excited to, t- Tom and I, for those of you who don't know, Tom and I live uh, within like quarter of a mile from each other. We're in the same neighborhood. So we see each other in passing, walking our dogs. We have a, we have a better relationship, Tom and I, than our dogs have with each other. So let's let's just put that out there that way. Um, But uh, I just, it's, such an honor when I, you know, I w- would walk by your house and sort of like, it was like walking by, you know, people who take buses to Liberace's house or something. I don't know. Liberace. I don't know. Where, why, why did I think of Liberace? I don't even know why that name popped into my head. But um, I just, the something I just was thinking about you as Ellen listed your title um, of your book, the holding good ideas in times of bad, you know, have my words wrong there, but misreading masculinity your latest one on embarrassment i feel yeah. like you you write these books Mine's that are like before their times like we're your your books are always very prescient about what's going to be hot topics and issues and i was thinking of how pantone that paint company comes yeah. out with uh, the colors yeah. for the following yeah. year yeah. and and you do that uh, oh, for you. teachers and you get us thinking about things that we may not have thought we needed to really think so much about. And, and so I, it's such an honor to well, thank have you. a chance to sit here and talk about talk. thought leadership, right? I mean, yeah. They're, my goodness. Well, it sits right next to you. Yeah. There he well, sits right next I to you. I think your work in, in terms of re helping us re-see what could happen and certainly the early grades, I think it's fantastic. And I think, as I say, it takes us back to the originating, it does. It some does. of the originating ideas. I think of Jerry Harsty and Ayetta Goodman, and I thought, you are the heirs to that mm-hmm. tradition. Mm-hmm. And now you can see why we wanted to bring you two people into the same room mm-hmm. at the same time and let you bounce ideas back and forth. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you for inviting Thanks us. Thanks for the invitation. Our thanks to authors Ellen Keane, Tom Newkirk, and Kathy Collins. If you'd like to learn more about their work, follow them on Twitter or learn more about the Turn and Talk series hosted by Ellen Keane. We invite you to visit blog.heineman.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.